Today in World Literature, we turn to the study of the works of Jamaica Kincaid. Our lecturer is Dr. Diane Simmons. In the lecture, Dr. Simmons argues that Jamaica Kincaid's most well-known work, Annie John, is not at all about the trauma of a Caribbean childhood. There are dark things in Kincaid, visions of a world that is found wanting. Jamaica Kincaid was born Elaine Potter Richardson on the tiny West Indian island of Antigua in 1949, when that island was still under British colonial rule. The descendant of Africans who were brought to the West Indies as slaves, and of Carib Indians, most of whom were wiped out by the coming of the Europeans, Kincaid is a writer who believes her life and even her identity has been shaped by the events of her personal and political history. Kincaid's central theme, a thread that runs through her autobiographical short stories and her autobiographical novels, is that of loss, an all but unbearable fall from paradise partly remembered, partly dreamed. The first loss experienced in Kincaid's fictional world is the loss of a once adoring mother who suddenly turns upon her child as the girl approaches puberty. In Kincaid's novel, Annie John, the mother, who has previously seen her daughter as beautiful and perfect, now sees the child as a mass of imperfection and immorality. The mother imposes rules designed to turn the girl into a young lady, but at the same time the mother also makes clear that she believes the project to be doomed, that no amount of training can overcome what she now perceives to be the girl's true nature, that of a slut. While, betrayed, while betrayal by a beloved mother is a theme that echoes throughout Kincaid's work, the first treachery is connected to another, that of British colonial power which dominated the Antigua of Kincaid's childhood. Both powers, maternal and imperial, demand childlike devotion and unquestioning trust, and both turn on the child in fury at the slightest hint of mature awareness. Like the betraying mother, Kincaid believes, the colonial system in pretending to nurture the child actually tries to steal her from herself. The British system drilled the West Indian children in English history and taught them the great English works of literature. These works testified to the beauty and grandeur of England and the English. The only conclusion that a West Indian child could draw from this education, Kincaid has written, was that everything about England was good and valuable, while everything about her own island home was worthless, not even worth mentioning. As a child, Kincaid felt that she must have done something wrong to be born into a world that so clearly was not what the world was supposed to be. Although the colonial education was designed, as Kincaid now sees it, to erase the reality of the colonial child, to replace the reality of her own life with the dream of England, this, de this design was not commonly perceived. Kincaid's mother, as well as everyone around Kincaid, seem to accept English domination, domination willingly and to believe that a thing could be, quote, divine and good only if it were English. Is there a connection between the betraying mother and the betraying colonial system? Kincaid suggests that there is. As the mother turns against her maturing daughter, seeing her as hopelessly bad, the mother seems to have internalized the picture of colonized peoples frequently painted by imperial authorities. The colonized people are seen to be innately inferior, both morally and intellectually, quote, half devil, half child, as Rudyard Kipling put it in his poem, The White Man's Burden. If the mother has been psychologically brainwashed to accept this view, it follows that as her daughter becomes less childlike, she must become more devil-like. For the mother, who has previously been able to see her daughter as all child, with all the innocent perfection of childhood, now sees the same girl as a liar, a thief, and a slut, who must be expelled from the paradise of a mother's love into the living death of a loveless purgatory. This, then, is the world Jamaica Kincaid was born into, and which she sought to escape at 16, leaving Antigua to come to New York, where she worked for a time as an au pair to a well-to-do family. 
For a time, she studied photography, worked at art magazines, then began to write as a freelance journalist. It was around this time in 1973 that the 24-year-old Elaine Potter Richardson became Jamaica Kincaid. Kincaid has explained the name change in numerous ways. It was a way of shucking family disapproval of her writing and gaining a sort of anonymity. This was a way to talk about things, she has said, without people knowing it was me. But more than that, the renaming seems to have been the nearly instinctual act of someone who knows herself to be losing oneself and finding another. Almost 20 years later, Kincaid put the act of renaming into a deeper context, writing that, quote, the naming of things is crucial to possession. It is not surprising that when people have felt themselves prey to conquest, among the first acts of liberation is to change their names, unquote. Kincaid's work, work and her life itself, then, are about the struggle to liberate the self from false, degrading identities imposed by others, from those who seem to nurture but finally betray. In New York, Kincaid met a man who worked for the New Yorker magazine, and he suggested that she, too, should write for the publication. Her first piece was a brief account of the annual West Indian Day parade in Brooklyn. Kincaid wrote that she wanted to jump up at the parade, to dance with the music of the bands, and noted that her mother had not allowed her to jump up at similar festivals at home. A few years later came the turning point in Kincaid's career when, in a single afternoon, she wrote the story Girl, which we have in our anthology. With this, she has said she found her voice as a writer. Here, Kincaid presents a microcosm of her future themes and concerns as a writer. The intense one-sentence story both celebrates and abhors the beauty and power of her childhood world. It demonstrates the pull of this world, why this world must be resisted, and why, once one has wrenched oneself away from it, the sense of loss is so powerful. Let's read the opening lines of this story as we try to see what it is that has finally opened the world of fiction up for the author. First, let me ask, Whose voice do we hear? It is, I think most of us would agree, the voice of a mother instructing her daughter and in doing so, describing a world. The story is not a transcript of actual remarks, though the opening, with its specific advice, gives the impression of literally recorded speech. Quote, wash the white clothes on Monday and put them on the stone heap. Wash the color clothes on Tuesday and put them on the clothesline to dry, unquote. What do we hear? Isn't it a nurturing maternal voice teaching her child how to do these necessary ta tasks, how to do them properly and well? As soon as we take this impression, however, Kincaid alters the terms ever so slightly. Imperceptibly, there is a change in the scope of the mother's remarks until they are seen to be not simple household advice, but a litany of protection and control, a chant that sounds the need for constant alertness to and study of one's surroundings. Implied here is the conviction that such alertness is the only defense against the magically dangerous world in which something bad might always fall on you. This is a voice that needs no help, no introductory, as my mother always said, no explanatory quotation marks. It is a voice so sure of itself and its power that it does not deign to explain itself in any way. Rather, with the first lines, we feel that we are picking up remarks in progress, that there is no beginning. It is a voice that does not pause or explain, but moves by its own logic, holding the reader with its repetitive and rhythmic patterns. It is not a voice to which one effectively speaks back, as the two italicized attempts at response make clear. And we realize this is not merely the mother's voice, but the mother's mesmerizing rhythm of life and knowledge power and protection as internalized by the daughter. This voice represents the energy and life of the childhood world Kincaid knows and reveals why it is not a world in which the daughter may remain if she wishes to grow into her own power. For the all-powerful voice of maternal nurture and knowledge is also the voice of condemnation and threat. The positive and negative currents are so mixed that it is nearly impossible to detect the moment at which one merges with the other. From the apparently benevolent advice on how to buy material for a blouse 
and how to cook fish, the voice turns to, quote, is it true that you sing Bina in Sunday school, end quote? This is a change, but it is still easily within the context of loving maternal interest. So is the next remark, though we may register the negative implication. This love has turned a little tough, quote, always eat your food in such a way that it won't turn someone else's stomach, unquote. We may feel ourselves back on solid ground with the next remark, quote, on Sunday try to walk like a lady, unquote, only to be slammed into the ugly accusation, quote, and not like the slut you are so bent on becoming. Where did benevolence turn to attack? Where exactly should we have put up our guard? With the suggestion that the girl eats in a disgusting way? With the question about the inappropriate singing of Benna, a type of folk song? Or even earlier, with the advice to Im immediately soak little cloths, which hints of menstrual blood, the onset of physical maturation, and thus the possibility of sluttishness. Reeling as the girl is reeling from the whipsaw effect of the mother's advice, we now read, quote, Don't sing Benna in Sunday school. You mustn't speak to wharf rat boys, not even to give directions, unquote. Does she sing Benna? Does she speak to wharf rat boys? Whether she does or not, she stands condemned. But any such protest is answered by the mother's ne next remark, which shows that, in her view, innocence and degradation fit inextricably together. Quote, don't eat fruits on the street. Flies will follow you. At this point, the daughter manages to answer back in the italicized, but I don't sing Benna on Sundays at all and never in Sunday school. It is a feeble protest which the mother does not even acknowledge. Does the girl even speak these words? Perhaps she only thinks them, for the mother's voice chants on about sewing buttons and buttonholes. Are we back on safe ground now? No, for soon we see the apparently innocuous, this apparently innocuous theme as a route back to the accusation of sluttishness. Quote, this is how to hymn address when you see the hymn coming down. And so, to prevent yourself from looking like the slut, I know you are so bent on becoming. Nurture and attack are here inseparable. One always masquerades as the other, turns into the other. And now, around line 25, nurture itself becomes dangerous. The mother's advice still has to do with household matters, but it is becoming increasingly clear that the efficient housekeeper must manage far more than laundry and shopping. She must know how to control and manipulate, quote, this is how you smile to someone you don't like too much. This is how you smile to someone you don't like at all, unquote. And she must be aware that nothing is ever what it seems, that dangerous magic is to be guarded against everywhere, quote, don't pick people's flowers, you might catch something. Don't throw stones at blackbirds, because it might not be a blackbird at all, unquote. Ultimately, the mother's own homely tasks are themselves seen as veering into the dangerously magical. Her recipes range from bread pudding to medicine for a cold to, quote, medicine to throw away a child before it even becomes a child. What finally is being taught in this maternal litany is that the world is full of mass dangers and that one of these dangers is the maternal voice itself. The story demonstrates the power of that voice, its mesmerizing, manipulative intensity, and shows the daughter's near help helplessness before it. After the first feeble reply, she is silent until the end of the story. Then she makes a remark that the mother does respond to, but only, it seems, because the girl's words can be used to incriminate her. When the mother, moving effortlessly from deadly magic to grocery shopping, advises squeezing the bread to make sure that it is fresh, the girl asks, quote, but what if the baker won't let me feel the bread? This time the mother does respond to her remark, as if perversely reminded of the earlier theme of sluttishness by the girl's very innocence. Quote, you mean to say that after all, you are really going to be the kind of woman who the baker won't let near the bread? Kincaid has said that finding her voice by finding her mother's voice liberated her as a writer. In doing so, she has come to terms with the force that has both nurtured and betrayed her. 
After writing Girl and a series of other surreal stories that were collected in the volume At the Bottom of the River, she went on to write Annie John, a coming-of-age story set in the West Indies, in which the treachery of the once-adoring mother and of the colonial system of education is spelled out. In Lucy Kincaid's next novel, The Story of a Young West Indian Au Pair in New York, the author continues to study the themes of loss and betrayal. The sense of loss may be even more powerful here than in Kincaid's other work, as the rich, beloved contradiction of her childhood world is not only figuratively, but also literally lost. Lucy, named her mother has told her after Lucifer, has been expelled from both her island home and her mother's life. Warm, vivid Antigua has been replaced by the pale chill of a North American winter. Lucy's powerful mother is lost to her forever, even as she continues to dominate the young woman's psychic life. In the autobiography of my mother, Kincaid's most recent novel, published just last year, Kincaid takes her fictional world back to the West Indies. Now Kincaid takes up her study of the effects of domination in earnest, creating the character Zuela, a girl born into a brutal world where the only possible human relationship is that of victim and victimizer. Unlike Annie and Lucy, who mourn a lost paradise, Zuela has known the score from the moment she was born and quickly learns that if there are only two choices, it is better to be the victimizer than the victim. She learns to turn the tables on those who would dominate her, in particular an English man who, rep who represents the last decayed vestiges of colonial rule. As his people have once captured hers, stealing from them everything that made them themselves, so she seduces and captures him removing him from everything that is comforting and familiar, everything that tells him who he is. Kincaid then continues to study questions of domination and the loss of self that results. With this last work, she suggests that it is not only the victim, but the victimizer who is lost, for neither is capable of a truly human relationship. Slave and slave master, colonized and colonizer, all have been trapped by their mutual histories in relationships based only on power. Finally, Kincaid suggests it is only by understanding the spell that history has cast upon us all that we may hope to emerge into our true selves to find our own true names. Is there a connection between the betraying mother and the betraying colonial system, or more broadly, is there a connection in the work of Jamaica Kincaid between the private and the public? In her book on Jamaica Kincaid, Dr. Simmons recalls for us another coming-of-age novel, that of the North American novelist J.D. Salinger. His Catcher in the Rye views impending maturity and the sexuality that inevitably accompanies it as deadly enemies of childhood's beauty and purity. But there is a difference. Even in his despair and loneliness, Holden can join in his culture. In Annie's world, there's no such volition. She cannot join in the world of maturity or decide to join it since she will never have what it takes to be a fully enfranchised adult. She'll never be white, she'll never be British. Thus, in the work of Jamaica Kincaid, we find that the themes of injustice and brutality for Kincaid, perhaps even the imagination itself, is not a sufficient creative weapon against injustice. It is difficult to say. What we can be sure of, however, is that the victim and the victimizer are both lost, both the indigenous people and the colonizers. Only by understanding the intricacy of this relationship is there any chance of understanding what we might find and how we might find our own true name.